Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for this time we have been given today. Uh, please bless this message and bless each one of us today. Amen. So growing up around evangelical circles, um, I heard it often that the way to God and the way to salvation is to pray the right kind of prayer. And that was it. That was a done deal. Uh, but one of my most vivid childhood memories was going to a movie called Amazing Grace. It was in the theaters. I was about 13 at the time. It's the true story about why the hymn was written and how William Wilberforce, uh, the, one of the congregants of the hymn writer, worked to abolish slavery. I was about 13 at the time again. And I was in that phase of my teenage years about whether or not I wanted to be a Christian. But I knew the kind of Christianity that I was seeing on the screen felt really authentic. And I wasn't seeing it in the circles I was in at that time. The Christianity I saw around me tended to be very inward focused. It tended to be very uh, how can I do this right so I don't get on God's bad side? And while being inward focused is not necessarily a bad thing, I mean, Quakers are all about an inward spiritual life. What is the point of that inward spiritual life? And what is the gospel that leads us to that? I remember when I became a Christian, I wrote in my journal, Life is beautiful. I know now that God wants me to let other people know that there is hope. I never knew just how different that would be for my theology later on in life. So how do we unpack this? Uh, let's go ahead and turn to Acts 9, 1 through 31. I'll be reading in the Common English Bible. This is right after the Ethiopian, almost right after. So meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, asking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. During the journey, as he approached Damascus, Suddenly a light from heaven encircled him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came the reply. Now get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. So those traveling with him stood there speechless. They heard the voice, but saw no one. And after they picked Saul up from the ground, he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see. So they led him by hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind, and neither ate nor drank anything. In Damascus there was a certain disciple named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision. Ananias, he answered, yes, Lord. Or at least you get a binder, huh? So the Lord instructed him, go to Judas. Go to Judas' house on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias enter and put his hands on him to restore his sight. So Ananias countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. People say he has done horrible things to your holy people in Jerusalem. He's here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest everyone who calls on your name. The replied, Lord replied, Go. This man is the agent I have chosen to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer 
for the sake of my name. So Ananias went to the house. He placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way as you were coming here. He sent me that you so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And instantly flakes fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after eating, he regained his strength. He stayed with the disciples in Damascus for several days. And right away, he began to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. He is God's son, he declared. Everyone who heard him was baffled. They questioned each other. Isn't he the one who was wrecking havoc among those in Jerusalem who called on his name? Hadn't he come here to take those people as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and stronger. He confused the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After this had gone on for some time, the Jews hatched a plot to kill Saul. However, he found out about their scheme. They were keeping watch at the city gates around the clock so they could assassinate him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. They didn't believe he was a really a disciple. Then Barnabas brought Saul to the apostle and told them the story of how Saul saw the Lord on the way. The Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them about the confidence with which Saul had preached in the name of Jesus in Damascus. And after this, Saul moved freely among the disciples in Jerusalem speaking in confidence in the name of the Lord. He got into debates with the Greek-speaking Jews as well, but they tried to kill him. When the family of believers learned about this, they escorted him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. God strengthened the church, and its life was marked by reverence for the Lord. Encouraged by the Holy Spirit, the church continued to grow in numbers. So what's this about? It's about how God reveals the image of God within each other. It's about how Saul saw the image of God in the people he was persecuting. It's about Ananias seeing the image of God in Saul. Saul or Paul dramatically changed his heart towards God. But first what needed to happen was for Jesus to appear and to say, and I'm paraphrasing it, this is the Nate Perrin version, uh, those people who you are persecuting, those people who you are throwing in prison, those people who want you dead, those are the people bearing my image. Saul wasn't expecting to meet Jesus that day, but he did. Saul wasn't expecting to renounce a lifestyle where he persecuted others and committed acts of horrible violence. But he did. For Saul, who would be called Paul in Roman circles, knew that part of following Jesus meant to forsake the way he did things. It meant to forsake the way he viewed people. The way he hated people. The way he went out of his way to make sure uh, the people called Christians would suffer. That would all have to be given up if he was going to follow Jesus. And that's where grace and forgiveness come in. God gives them that chance to make things right. God tells them, in a paraphrase again, that he walks all in this new journey of discovering what it means to live in this new freedom. And discovering that everyone was made in his image and therefore has value. For Saul, the gospel wasn't an event where he got down on his knees, prayed the right kind of prayer, and then continued to live his life as if nothing happened. It wasn't this event that's a stereotypical conversion story we talk normally hear, where someone becomes a Christian and a life gets better. The Methodist pastor in Winey Walk actually calls this uh, Pollyanna Christianity. When Saul actually becomes a Christian, he realizes that he must give up those things in order to walk with Christ. And Jesus is even more direct than Ananias in verse 16 and tells him that he must also accept Saul. He was being repentant about the things he did. 
He also tells them that Saul will suffer in this life for standing with them. And that Saul's life wasn't going to be easy. This is a little bit of a controversial message, especially if you're in the ancient world. I listened to an audiobook recently about a Quaker abolitionist named Benjamin Lay. Um, he sounds like something made up. He was uh, four feet tall, lived in a cave, made his own clothes. Um, he was a Quaker who uh, was before John Woolman's time in ministry. And what Benjamin Lay would do, among many things, was that he would lie on the ground before the entrances into meeting houses without shoes, or without any kind of protective gear, uh, clothes to help him, even in the winter. And people would literally have to step over him to get into worship. And when people tried to step over him, they would ask him why he was doing what he was doing. And he would reply that a slave would be wearing less clothes than he was wearing that day. And that they only cared because he was part of them. He was known for these dramatic stunts uh, that would irritate and anger the early Quakers. Um, he was actually kicked out of four friends' meetings at the time because they were controlled by wealthy slave owners. But it was because of his ministry that John Woolman was able to find space to do his work. And that John Woolman's work would eventually have the slave trade denounced by the Quakers. And uh, Quakers ceased owning slaves by the time the Revolutionary War came around. When I was listening to Benjamin Lay's story, I had a mixture of feelings. I imagine someone doing this in today's context. I mean, how would you all react if I laid at the entrance of the church with some issue that I cared about? That would be kind of an interesting way to do things. But he made his point on the conscience of the Quakers that if the inner light was in all people, that then that included the slaves. That's the kind of prophetic voice Saul becomes in declaring that Jesus is God's son. This was not only a theological statement about Jesus and who he was, but a political one. The Roman emperors at this time called themselves sons of God in reference to the emperors before them. To call Jesus the son of God was to turn that authority on its head. And grace is meant to transform us into new people, into people of compassion, into people that see suffering and don't separate ourselves from it. Grace is meant to grow us into Jesus-looking people. Grace is meant to push us into the mess to be a part of people's stories. I mentioned earlier a little bit about the story behind Amazing Grace. Again, the hymn was written by a, a priest named John Newton. He was a slave ship captain, captain who became a Christian during a bad storm. And over time, after reading the Bible, he renounced all of that and became a priest. A member of his parish, William Wilberforce, ended up being the lead voice in England to abolish slavery. This was during a time when slaves weren't considered worthy of even a full Bible. I have a copy of the slave Bible down here if anyone wants to look through it afterwards. Um, that was used to teach slaves. One of the sentences of the introduction says, in their attempt to eliminate all verses that could plant the seeds of rebellion and hope in the minds of slaves, about 90% of the Old Testament and about 50% of the Old, New Testament was deleted. In the standard Protestant Bible, there are 1,189 chapters. But the Bible given to the slaves contains 232. So absent from the Bible were all of the Psalms, which express hope from God's delivery from oppression, and the entire book of Revelation. In the slave Bible, the book of Exodus excludes the story of the rescue of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, which is the story that gives the biblical book its title. 
So why have I kind of brought up these issues in this sermon? Because I believe the way we respond to the issues around us today are going to echo into history and then into eternity. For instance, slavery is still around. One of the most heartbreaking workshops I attended was about human trafficking and how they lure Chinese women into it. You would be shocked how visible and apparent this issue is. When I heard the workshop, I was at a complete loss for words. Um, that night, I spent two hours just decompressing and repenting for turning my back on that issue. Another issue is uh, poverty. Ron Sider, a Mennonite theologian, did the math and pointed out that if megachurches in America were to uh, spend their money in more wiser ways, they could potentially eliminate poverty in the United States. Here's my point. Don't think the gospel stops at you going to heaven because of the Jesus prayer. The gospel has another half to it. And it says you must be reconciled both to God and to your neighbor. This isn't easy. Uh, this is a call that says you're going to have a tough time. This is a call that says loving both God and your neighbor in a radical new way may lead to pain and loss. But this is Jesus' advice in the face of all that. Continue to love anyway and trust that he is with you. To be a Christian means to announce you are carrying Jesus' name on your faith. It means that you're committed to a God of love. I like to imagine conversations I will have with my kids someday. Obviously, a lot needs to happen. Let's get over that barrier. <laughs> but I like to imagine having these kind of conversations with them. So imagine my kids someday coming home and asking me, Hey, Dad, do you remember COVID-19? And uh, they're going to ask about how I acted. And I'm probably going to skip over a lot of things that make me look like a lesser person. I'll probably skip over the fact that I watched way too much Netflix. Uh, but something I want to say to them someday was that I was committed to living out the faith that I have. Uh, this isn't over yet, obviously. I can't say that I that will do that. Hopefully I am. But I want to be able to say to my kids someday that I lived my faith with conviction and compassion. So when I read about the slave Bible, I realize in many ways it's the kind of Bible that, for lack of a better word, it's a very Western gospel. It's a Bible that's free of any kind of conviction. It's a Bible that's free of any kind of compassion. It's a Bible that is free of God caring about the poor, the least of these. It's a Bible free of those troubling verses that we come across about how Jesus is with the poor, about how Jesus is with the least of these. It's a troubling Bible because it doesn't have any verses about what freedom really means. I don't know about you, but I want to follow the whole gospel. I want to read how I'm supposed to live my life like Jesus, uh, no matter how uncomfortable it can get. The whole gospel tells us that Jesus radically loves us and reconciles us to him. So therefore, we are to reconcile with our neighbors and participate in redemption. Saul's conversion begins with him seeing the image of God in the people he was persecuting. Many people seem to miss that point, but through his repentance, he comes to see a new way of life and a new way of belief. Jesus shows how Saul ends up becoming more grateful that the curtain was lifted and was able to see God. Saul describes this in other places as apocalypse. An apocalypse in Greek, uh, despite the common term being used, apocalypse actually means a veil being lifted and you see how things really are. So Paul's apocalypse was seeing that everyone was made in God's image. It was seeing that God was with the people he was going after. So what will our response to be? God lifting our veil today. 
and us seeing the way things really are. Will we live in radical submission to the way of Jesus, to the way of love and compassion? Will we keep that to ourselves and live no different? I wrote this sermon last night and I had to go back and <laughs> delete a lot of it because I realized I'm not talking to people who are the problem. But I know this can be a lot to take in. Because I'm starting to get more and more passionate about these issues. But the important thing is, is that this passage, as well as the rest of the Bible, can invite us to wrestle with God and what He would have us do during this time. Ask for the veil to be lifted. We're going to listen to Amazing Grace and listen for the lyrics that push John Newton to action. Listen to the lyrics that made him realize that amazing grace means that not only is he forgiven, but that he has a chance to make things right in this world. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the time you've been given today. Uh, thank you for your uh, message of reconciliation and hope. Help us to always remember that we are all made in your image and you call us to follow through on loving each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.